So just to run through quickly the process of donor linking. So there's an application form and the applicant comes to see Cathy or I and together we write a statement of reasons. Uh, that goes to the other, uh, the other party and they decide whether they would agree or not to contact. Uh, they are also very welcome to come and see us for support and those close to them are too. Uh, and so uh, Cathy and I can facilitate contact and exchange of in information between the two parties and very much tailor that to what each person wants. There are options for contact and uh, each person gets a chance to say that, what they prefer. And we're also there to provide support if there are any issues. So when people come and see us, we want to reassure they're not being assessed. We're very neutral, we're absolutely confidential. Uh, we work as mediators and facilitators between each party. So we look at the short and long-term motivations and, and implications for each person and we try and unpack any unrealistic uh, expectations that people have and we try and support each party and those that are close to them and we help them write their statement of reasons. You might want to know a bit more about what that is and so this is the document that goes to the other party. It's often difficult to put into words why you want to have contact with the other person. It, we advise to keep it simple, to really say what they want to say, um, be honest about it to give a little bit of personal information about themselves and talk about what they'd like in the short term and the long term so that the other person is clear about what they're saying yes or no to. And this can be handwritten. If kids come along, um, if they're parents of young children, they also can, can um, contribute. So here's an example of one. This is quite a brief one. Often they're much longer, but I want to show you a, a short one so that you could see it. And um, this is a gorgeous one from a seven-year-old and a very typical seven-year-old um, young boy there. <laughs> very practical and concrete. Do you have a car, ute, van, motorbike or truck? <laughs> so the first steps, we usually encourage email contact so people get, can, can get in touch with each other either using their own email or if they prefer a non-identifying email. And if they choose to meet, we suggest they do that when they don't feel like strangers anymore and it feels more comfortable and they're less likely to be quite so nervous. But if they do meet, I can guarantee each person is extremely nervous, very excited and it's really quite bizarre for them and feels very strange. Um, but usually they're very pleased to have done so. So what happens next? Uh, when there's initial contact, often there's an absolute honeymoon phase of a flurry of emails, then there can sometimes be gaps in communication. It, for, it doesn't always flow easily for people. Remember, there are, these are two strangers communicating with each other. So sometimes it can actually be quite clunky, and that's why Cathy and I are here to, to help with that. Obviously, it depends on the individuals and whether you actually like each other. Some people never meet. Some meet only once and some form friendships. Some continue just to email. It takes years to build a friendship and this is no different. People often feel uncertain where they fit in and often feel like they're working, walking on eggshells for a very long time. Because they're trying to work out, well, who are we to each other? I might be your biological parent, but you know, I haven't been your dad or your mum, and who am I to you? I'm your biological son or daughter, but you, you, you know, I haven't been within your family. So it takes a long time to, to feel comfortable with that. And naturally, it also has implications for those close to those, all those people. What can go wrong? Uh, sometimes people can rush and go too fast and then crash and burn. Sometimes people aren't clear about what they want and so then they can come off the rails um, because it's hard if people just agree uh, with what the other person's saying rather than being honest about what they really want. And sometimes um, secrets are kept from other family members and then they find out and then they can feel angry, betrayed and unsupported. I wish there was a book like this. One day we'll write one. It's on my wish list. I think from uh, seeing 
each party's uh, situation. I think there are actually more things in common than there are differences. And we all have common questions and concerns. Everyone's wondering what's appropriate or inappropriate when they first connect. It's natural to feel excited and very anxious. We recommend people going, taking their time, going slowly and carefully, because all friendships and relationships take time to, to build, and this is no different. So it's important to have an open mind, to communicate honestly, to clarify expectations and boundaries, uh, and think about what is in the best interest for the donor-conceived person. And, but also to think about that everyone is important in this equation and we need to be respectful and, and thoughtful and sensitive to everybody that's involved. It's early days. Uh, we're very conscious that Victoria is absolutely in the forefront. We are all still learning in this area. But what I can tell you is that the people that have connected have been, in the main, very, very positive about it and uh, very pleased that they have done so. Uh, relationships are still developing and we want to follow this up and see what's happening. Respect, sensitivity and goodwill are key ingredients uh, in all of this. Uh, and I think we do have a moral and ethical responsibility to donor-conceived people who weren't asked about uh, this when they were conceived. So for those interested in learning more about this uh, area, uh, we're conscious we only have a limited amount of time, but we have a wealth of resources on our website, so I'd really encourage you to have a look at those.